brings forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. together this morning. Dear Jesus, we just thank you so much that we can call you Savior and that we claim these promises this morning, that no matter how big the mountain is around us, you can move that, Lord. We trust on you this morning. Lord, we live in a very dark age. You know it more than we know it. And Lord, if we shine our light to the people around us, we know that you are faithful faithful to speak through us, Lord. We pray that we will be the salt, that we will be the light of the earth. And Lord, we just thank you for being our Father, for blessing us with so many good and perfect gifts. We just lift you up this morning and pray that you are blessed by our praises. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I see the King of glory. Coming on the clouds with fire, the whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes. I see his love and mercy washing over all my sin. The people sing, the people sing. I 
I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a near revival stirring as we pray and seek. We're on our we're on our knees. Sing out Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the As I walk from earth into eternity. Let's sing Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. be seated. Well, thank you again, uh, worship team and musicians, for leading us in those wonderful songs of praise. It just reminds us about how wonderful and glorious this God we serve is. Thank you for those wonderful wonderful reminders. Uh, will you join your heart with mine as we seek the Lord together in prayer this morning? Precious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for giving us this opportunity to gather in this place on this Father's Day in the year of 2016 just to lift our voices in praise to you and to remember how wonderful and great you are in creation, in your love and in your mercy and in your grace. Surely you are a good God. We trust, Lord God, that these songs that we have sung have come up to you a sweet and fragrant offering from hearts and lips that are deeply in love with Jesus this morning. We thank you, Lord God, once again for your Holy Spirit's presence, the warmth and the love that we feel from that, and the warmth and love we have as we gather with fellow believers in this place. It is a joy to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And as we bask in the warmth of your presence and the fellowship of believers, we're reminded that many of our people are traveling today. And we would ask you, Lord God, to watch over and keep them and bring them back to us safely. The day might sense a tangible presence of your Holy Spirit with them as we lift them to the throne now. We are reminded, Lord God, that there are people from our congregation who are in the hospital today. We're reminded, Lord God, of so many senior saints that are in uh, nursing homes and facilities, Lord God, where they can't come to worship. And I'm sure for many of them, 
the deepest desire of their heart is to be in this place this morning. So we lift them to the throne this morning, asking you, again, to be a very real and tangible presence with them, that they might sense your loving arms around them as we lift them to you. And Lord, we pray for ourselves this morning as we continue to go through our time of worship and celebration here, that you would be very real to each and every one of us. Lord God, that you might once again meet us right at our point of need and change us, change us by your presence with us. May we all be able to go away from this place different than the way we came in with a new song of praise, if only in our hearts, singing glory, hallelujah, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord this day. All of these things we pray in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our sanctifier, our healer, and our soon coming King. We love you, Lord, and all God's people said, amen, amen, amen and amen. I told the people in the first service as I was praying that in the name of Jesus, our soon coming King, um, if you read the paper this morning, you know, I like to read the letters to the editor in the, in the paper. It's, it's almost as funny as the funny paper sometimes, right? Definitely as loony as the funny paper sometimes. But today, there was a letter in there from Mark Morrow, and he was talking about uh, predicting the headlines in the Erie paper and ended it with the fact that Jesus is coming soon. So I encourage you, and they printed it. They printed it in the Erie Times News. So I encourage you to get that, read that letter. It was encouraging to my heart, and I, I trust it will be to yours. Uh, I am reminded of a couple of things. Next Sunday is Great Commission Sunday, and, and we have in your bulletin a Great Commission Sunday insert. And you know, our goal for the year is $48,000. This is just going to kind of give us a little boost, uh, something we haven't done in a long time is give a, a special offering like in the middle of the program. So we're asking you to prayerfully consider giving something extra to the Great Commission Fund next week. You can put that in the offering plate. Maybe we'll see 50 or 55,000 going to the Great Commission Fund this year. Also, I want to remind you that uh, Wednesday, if you're in the membership class, there'll be no membership class this Wednesday. If you are a board member, we need to have a special quick board meeting following prayer meeting Wednesday night. Please be here for that. We're going to be talking about the parking lot. So, Board of Ministries meeting. I was reminded this morning, by the way, that our softball team, LRAC, go LRAC, 6-0. and oh. Wow. Yeah. 6-0. and oh. Now, listen, they got a little bit of a break. They're not playing now until June 28th, but I encourage you, especially if you got your yellow T-shirts with LRAC on them, come out and support our team June 28th. We're 6-0. and oh. We're on our way to another championship. Praise the Lord. All right? So, we have fun, too. And there was something else. Oh, camp. Camp has started up. You know, the, the, the children's camps. And we're getting good, good, we're getting good uh, feedback from Mahaffey Camp and from uh, Trails End Ranch out in uh, Montana about young people making first-time commitments to Christ. Young people. How desperately we need to be getting the gospel into our young people. And many um, recommitting their lives to Christ at our camps. Now, Ben Baker, our youth director, he has already gone to a camp uh, for this coming week, but he asked us if we could have all the kids who are going to any camp this summer, we had a bunch of them in the first service, all the kids who are going to any camp this summer to come forward, and the elders are going to have a word of prayer over you. So they were a little hesitant, and I said, here we go, okay, hey, all the way up here, all right, this is my kind of guy, all right. Okay, we're going to go in the front seats, okay? We're going to go right here and get all the kids over here or the young people who are going to camp. Just go right down here and sit. And we're going to ask the elders to come forward. And we're going to have a word of prayer. Yeah, we're getting these great reports. And boy, I'm just so thankful that so many of our, our young people are, are, are going to camp this year. And I'm going to ask you, you know, to join with us. And, and, and we're going to pray. Now, we had an amazing thing happen in the first service. I asked all the young people if they would hold hands so we could kind of be joined together and the elders laid hands on and we just had the spirit flowing through all of us. That's great. Praise the Lord. See, good things are happening already. <laughs> and we haven't even gone to camp yet. So will you join your hearts with mine as we pray over these young people to go to camp? Precious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for so many young people at East Lake Road Alliance Church. It encourages our heart 
we see another generation interested in the things of the Lord, and for this we give you thanks. It is life. and It is beautiful. And we would ask you, Lord God, to watch over each and every one of these young people as they attend camp this summer. Lord God, that you would keep them safe, that you would speak to their hearts, that you would, Lord God, uh, call them uh, into something that you want to do with their lives. Some of them may be into missions, Lord God, some into full-time ministry, some just being all they can be in this world. The world desperately needs to see Jesus real, and maybe you'll use some of these young people to do just that. We pray for them and their families, Lord God, and supporting them uh, in their desire to go. And we ask, Lord God, that you just simply be very real to each and every one of them. Bring them back to us, Lord God. And maybe at the end of the summer, we'll have a program where we can hear what God has spoken to them. All of these things we pray in Jesus' name and with much thanksgiving. And again, all God's people said, amen. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, young people. Yeah. Be praying for them. We're going to ask the men to come forward to prepare to collect the morning tithes and offering. And as they're doing that, getting ready to prepare the, the uh, material tithes and offerings, we want to give one or two an opportunity to give a verbal tithe of praise this morning. God certainly has blessed us with a beautiful day, wonderfully. And uh, we want to praise him for that. Somebody a word of praise. Yes, Rich. Amen. Thank you for being faithful and planting that seed. Somebody else a word of praise? Yes. Here you go. I want to thank God for the wonderful father I have. Amen. Amen. I couldn't ask for a better dad or not. Praise I'm God. Church, but you've got Sunday dinner on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. He took care of you, Karen. God bless you, honey. Amen. Okay. Yes, John. Praise God. Amen. Wow. How can we not say God is good? All the time. In so many different ways. John, would you ask a blessing on the offering?
Thank you again, ladies, for that beautiful offertory, reminding us again, great is thy faithfulness. All right, kids, you want to go to junior church? I guess they do, amen. I love their energy, you know. I, lo I love to see young kids and, and, and in the church. It just, again, speaks of another generation uh, seeking uh, God and, 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 and His truth. And boy, it just encourages my heart. We're going to be looking today at um, a, a message that talks about four men. You know, it's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. If I didn't say that to you guys when you came in, happy Father's Day. But we're looking at four men, but, but the message is about the call, and the call is for all. So that rhymes. I didn't even think of that. I must be coming poetic in my senior years, praise the Lord. Um, but the call is for all of us. So while we're going to be talking about some men specifically, the message is about the call, and it should re reflect in somehow all of us. So we're going to be looking at Mark. We're going to continue our, our, our look through the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. We're going to look at a lot of scripture. We're going to stay close to God's word. Uh, and in saying that, I, I was really um, blessed. You know, we have this live stream thing going now. So if you're not in church on Sunday, you can on live stream watch the, the program at East Lake Road Alliance Church. And it's really awesome. And I got to see Dave uh, Volker and, and, and Ben Baker, and these men are coming along so wonderfully as, as uh, uh, speakers of truth, God's Word. And they stayed, they just kept presenting the, the, the Word to us. And, you know, that's all we've really got as preachers. All we've got is the Word of God. I mean, if we didn't have the Word of God, we wouldn't have much to say to you. You could sing a couple songs and go home, amen. But we're going to look to the Word of God again today, and we're going to look at it um, I might say rather deeply, but this is really basic. When you're, when you're talking about the Gospels, uh, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, for believers, it's, these are basic truths, but so many times we need to be reminded of the, the basic truth. So I trust that you get blessed as we go through this. What I want to do before I read the passage is try to set the scene as best I can for this passage of Scripture. We're going to put a couple of slides up there. Um, this Sea of Galilee... This is as it looks today, uh, some, some amateur photos from our last trip. But as we come to this passage, morning would have been breaking, and the night would have yielded to day. The sky would have been turning from black to blue, and the first rays of sunshine would have revealed some hard-working men busily engaged in their occupation. Those men were used to seeing the sun rise over the Sea of Galilee. These guys were fishermen, and their job required them to fish most of the time during the cool of the night when the fish were feeding. And after a long night of fishing, all that was left was to clean the catch, mend the nets, and prepare them for the next day, and then sell the fish to those who would sell them in the marketplaces. So that's the Sea of Galilee today. Being a fisherman in those days would have been a very hard life, a lot of physical labor. But it did put bread on the tables of these men's families and a roof over their heads. And while it was a hard life, it was an extremely important life. All the people in Israel and in other places depended on the catch these men brought back to shore. Some of their catch would have been salted and shipped all the way to Rome. Imagine it. It's possible that Caesar himself could have eaten some of the fish these very men caught. Now, it's interesting because if you go there today even, and you saw some of the city around the lake, Tiberias especially is a, a large community right there on the lake, they've got several little outdoor cafes that are supplied by the kibbutzes around the area with the fish. They call it St. Peter's Fish. And it's interesting because it looks just like a large Lake Erie perch. Bigger. Well, not as big as some of the ones that our guys have been catching lately, but big, right? And uh, they barbecue them. They just simply barbecue them over coals, and they serve them to you whole. And they are absolutely delicious. So this, this fishing was a very important uh, uh, occupation in that day. Anyway, as these guys were fishing uh, and finishing up their work from fishing so that they could go home and rest their weary bodies, a man that they had all known or heard about or seen sometime prior passes by on the shore. 
And he spoke just a very few words to them. But what they heard would forever change the course of their life. And that's what we're going to look at this morning in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. Now, if you were in Sunday school this morning, you probably heard this already. But we're going to look at it maybe with a little different slant. The word says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord God, for what it represents and what it speaks. And I would pray, Lord God, that as we look into this word over the next few minutes, that you would just hide once again this pastor behind the word of God and the cross of Christ. And Lord, that you might speak to us by your presence with us and by the word itself. All this we pray to your glory, Jesus. Amen. Now, what we just described to you, that may have been the scene when Jesus passed by those boats where Peter, Andrew, James, and John were fishing or working. We don't know for sure, but this we do know. His call to those four men changed their lives forever, forever. Now, if you're, again, outlining Mark, you realize that we're in a place now where the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is just beginning. And one of the first acts that he does is to choose some men to assist him and to, so that he might disciple them and that, he could, uh, that they might assist him in his work. He's calling here, and it's going to be the theme uh, throughout this message and probably the next one or two, because we only got through the first point, I think, in the first service, so we probably won't get through much further this time. He's calling ordinary men to do the extraordinary work of God. And I say men because men are what we have in this passage. But his call is the same. We were reminded that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still in the business of calling people today. He is calling people to come to him for salvation. That's the gospel, the good news. That's why when you preach through the gospels, you got to preach the good news. Hey, the good news is this. You don't have to pay for your sins. The good news is this. You don't have to die. The good news is this. You're forgiven. Jesus paid the price. That's the good news. That's a reason, by the way, to get excited. You all must be hungry. Your stomach's growling or something. Amen. I don't know about you, see, but I get excited about these basic concepts, these truths of our faith. He's calling today. Our text reveals something about this matter of the Lord's call. This passage opens up to us some characteristics found in these verses concerning his call. And what I want to do this morning is examine some of those characteristics. And and I trust that as we do that, some of you might feel, maybe for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time, the Lord actually speaking to your heart. And if he is speaking to your heart, I trust that you will respond. So let's look at these characteristics of the call, because they're the same as they were then, they are today. The first thing that we might notice here is that the call on these men was very personal. It is today, too. We see this in the fact that he walked up to those boats, and he called those four men specifically. Now, surely there must have been other boats anchored in the Sea of Galilee that morning. There might have been many there. But he called four specific men out of two specific boats. That's personal, dear hearts. And so it is with us. The Lord calls us personally. It's an intensely personal matter. 
And when he calls us, he deals with us one-on-one. Now, again, this may sound very simple and basic, but we would do well to remember how special and personal the Lord's call is on one's life. Do you remember, if you're saved, when he called you to salvation? Do you remember that moment in time? You may have been sitting in a church. You may have been sitting in a stadium. You may have been home listening to something on the radio or reading your Bible, and God spoke to you individually. Do you realize how special that is? Do you remember when he called you to some specific purpose and you answered yes and how blessed you were? He called you and not the person next to you. That's special. He called you and not a family member. That's special. Dear hearts, you need to remember how special you are to the Lord. Because indeed, if you have been called, you are special. Remember, Jesus said, no one can come to me. The Father calls him. That's special. When Jesus called these men, he found them working. And this is another thing we need to think about. He called them in the midst of the ordinary, in the midst of the mundane. They were just going about their everyday business. He found them going about his everyday business. Peter and Andrew were casting their net, we're told. John and James were preparing and mending theirs. And there's something to be said about that because it seems that his call to them fit perfectly with the experience they already had or their personalities. In other words, their likes and dislikes. It fit perfectly. And it speaks to my heart about how God uses, uses what we already have, things from our past, and somehow takes those things that are worldly from our past, sanctifies them, makes them holy so that we can use them after he calls us to do what he's called us to do. For instance, Peter and Andrew, after they were called, were still casting the gospel net. They were either preaching sermons or bringing people to Jesus. They were simply continuing to do what they were doing before they were called. They were casting their net. They were doing evangelism. On the other hand, James and John spent time preparing the gospel and that mending it to ensure that the fish did not swim away. Their emphasis was on the progression and growth of the church and the body of Christ. We have that same word preparing or mending translated in Ephesians 4.12 where he said some are sent to prepare others for the work. Sometimes the church needs preparing and they were busy with edification. So we see evangelism and edification here. God simply took the things that these men were doing or interested in, sanctified them, and then used them for eternal good. Do you see what I'm saying? See, some people think that their lives are such a wreck that they can't even come to Jesus. They're so bogged down in worldly things, and a lot of it's sin, a lot of it's just worldly things, that they think God can't use that. God can use all of our past to bring him glory in our future. See, I just give you, you know, I can just give you some personal examples without telling on anybody who's confided in me anything, right? See, you can't tell me, you can't tell me that God is not capable of delivering a person, for instance, from alcohol. Now, I was never an alcohol abuser, but I used it, and God delivered me from it. You can't tell me that God can't deliver you from a foul mouth, because he can You can't tell me that God can't deliver you from cigarette smoking because he did me. Unless you think you serve a different God or it's a different God we're talking about. You can't tell me that God can't deliver you out of a false religion into the light of his truth because he delivered me. See? Are you with me? Okay. See, God takes that stuff in our past, sanctifies it, and makes it usable in our future for His glory. Amen. And this ministry of evangelism and this ministry of edification are needed in the church today. 
Not all of us have the same giftedness, but all of us are called to do something. I'm getting ahead of myself. The question is, are you doing what God has equipped you to do? Where he has called you to do it. See, a good test in this, a good test in this, and I don't mean to step on anybody's toes. I really don't want to. But, you know, we have to be practical, right? Practical? Can I get amen on Let's be. So you can't get an amen on being practical because the world is so impractical today. We have to be practical, right? And, and, and a simple test, and, 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 and I, I'm not, especially I don't want the senior saints to consider this because so many of the senior saints of our church have done so much work. And there's only so much you can, there is only so much any person can do. But you could ask yourself on a test of this, am I in service anywhere? Am I in service? Am I doing anything for the kingdom? It's a good test. Now, I don't, probably doesn't apply to anybody here because we're all doing something, amen. I hope so. But you see what I'm saying? Practical test. If you want the Lord to use you, see, you got to get busy for him where you are. When you're faithful where he has placed you, he will eventually open up larger arenas of service for you. It's just the way it works. It's, Jesus said something about that in Luke where he said, you know, if you're faithful with much, if you're not faithful with much, you're not going to be, I mean, with a little, you're not going to be faithful with much. I found in my own life that any time I stopped maturing in my faith is because I chose to stop walking in the light that was given to me. God's not going to give you any more light to your be obedient with the little bit of light he's shown you. Practical stuff. I'm convinced the Lord wants all of us to, to realize his power and his guidance, yet we settle for so little because we simply refuse to be moved. His call to these men was to move and become what he wanted them to become. His call is the same. He'll call us out of the mundane, and he calls us to move and become. Sometimes we get so comfortable in a routine. Now, I'm not preaching to you. I'm, I'm preaching to me as well, right? Amen. We get so comfortable in a routine. See, so many of the times we come to church on Sunday because, like, that's our habit. We're Christians. That's what we do. We go to church on Sunday. And we don't expect anything to happen because it's become so routine. Yet God called these men out of the thing that they were doing every day. Do you think that they went there expecting the Lord to call them personally? No. But they were ready. I think sometimes we don't get anything from God when we come to church on Sunday because we simply come not expecting to get anything. And God is just waiting, calling. I believe, and most scholars believe, that this event describes a, a subsequent meeting that these men had with the Lord. They, they met him in, in John chapter 1 for salvation. And then here, they're meeting him, and he's calling them into his service. And I would suggest to you this morning, regardless of what this life leads you into, the most important thing in the world. You say, Pastor, not again. Salvation, not again. Yes. Salvation again. And as long as I'm here preaching, you're going to hear about salvation. Because I could talk to you about service all day long. I could talk to you about prayer, being in Sunday school. I could talk to you about all these things all day long. But until you have that first encounter with Jesus for salvation, nothing else matters. Do you know that? Nothing in the world matters. And I'm not sure everybody in this place is saved. And I don't want your blood on my hands. So I'm giving you the truth. I don't care how good you are, how much money you give away, how many good works you do. Until you know Christ is your personal Savior, it all amounts to nothing. Yes. These men were called first to salvation, then to service. And getting saved isn't the end of the road. The Lord saves us. He wants to use us, move us deeper with him. He desires us to become his disciples. 
regardless of the type of call that comes our way in life, whether it be for salvation or sanctification or service or whatever it is, we need to heed the call. The question again that poises itself to us over and over and over again, is Jesus really Lord of my life? Personally, each one needs to be asking that over and over and over again. And again, the Lord must have been dealing with the hearts of these men since they had first met him. And I can relate to this. I can remember meeting people who knew the Lord as their Savior. Very few, but I met them. God sent them my way. And I saw something different in them. And it was something that the Lord, some seed the Lord planted that made it for me something that I wanted. And it took several, several people to bring me to a saving knowledge of Jesus. But I thank God that I came when I did. When he calls, we need to come. It's a very personal call. And it's a call to move and become. Then we see also this fact or this characteristic that not only is it personal, it is also public. Watch this now. The Lord does his private work, but he gets the glory, really gets the glory when his will is worked out in our lives publicly. These men were called to make a public stand for Jesus. They were called upon to publicly line up with him, to line up with his preaching and what he was doing. Now, we also know in God's word through, through, through the years and examples that we have in the word of God, that there were men who tried to keep their faith private. You think of, um, uh, all right, Rick, where'd it go? That's why I have notes, see. You think of Joseph of Arimathea. Remember, for fear of the Jews, he didn't talk about his faith. But when you get into John chapter 19, he went to Pontius Pilate and asked for the body of the Lord publicly. He couldn't keep his faith private. You think of Nicodemus. Nicodemus in John chapter 3 who went to the Lord in, in, in the uh, stillness of the night when there was nobody around, probably for fear of the Jews, maybe for fear of his family. But he couldn't keep his, his faith private. He went to the ruling uh, officials and talked to them about Jesus regarding the law. You can't keep it private. You can try, but you will be the most miserable of men. Again, I can only speak for myself, and I only will speak of myself. But I can remember after I got saved, trying to keep the fact that I was different away from people who I thought would be uh, change their attitude towards me because I was now a believer in Jesus Christ, like I was crazy or something. You know what I'm talking about. I was miserable until I asked the Lord to sanctify me and fill me with His Spirit. God did not save us. God did not call us so that we would hide ourselves away and pretend that we are just like everyone else. My friend Pat Kelly used to say, we got too many CIA Christians around. That's the problem. Undercover agents. So many of them are so deep undercover, they don't even know that they're Christians. <coughs> We've got to be visible in our faith. We live in a world that is becoming darker and darker practically by the day. It's unbelievable how dark this world has gotten. I was reading on Yahoo News yesterday. I told my wife that, I mean, because things are happening now, evils that we couldn't even have imagined just a few years ago. I got to tell you this story. I'm reading this Yahoo News article about a guy who is married and has several children. And he decides he's not a guy anymore, right? So he starts to get the, uh, you know, the augmentation stuff they do, right? And he's on his way to becoming a female. But in the midst of that, he says, well, hey, I ain't going all the way with this deal. Uh, so now I don't know what I am. 
I'm a man and I'm a woman, right? But he needed to get legal status for some reason for this thing that he is. So he goes to a judge in Portland, Oregon, and the judge declares a third sex. This man is legally now a they. <laughs> what is wrong with this? You know, what is wrong with the lesbian community, the, the gay community, the transgender community? Listen, we have to love everyone. We must love them into the kingdom as best we can. What is wrong with it is that it goes against the very foundation of God's creation. He created them male and female. That's what's wrong with it. It's simply sin. That's all it is. And we are called in this dark world, just like those men were called to follow Jesus publicly, we are called to take a stand and be liked. We have that passage in Matthew. And let me tell you something. The darker the world gets, all we got to be is a little spark and people will see us. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do you light a lamp. Think how silly it would be to light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, you put it on its stand so it gives its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men. What? Here it is. That they may see your good deeds and give you the praise. No. 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 We are to be lights in this dark world so that God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit might be seen in us. So the truth might be revealed. Not because we hate these people, because we love them. You know, I just think, again, it, it, it's, it's, it's true for me as it is for you. I just think sometimes, sometimes because we are in such a dark place, that, that our energy gets drained, doesn't it? You have to admit, sometimes you, just, sometimes you just feel like giving up. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 12, 11, and then in Romans 13, 11. Two easy verses for you to remember. 12, 11 and 13, 11. Never dawned on me before. It just did now. Because Paul knew. And Paul, talking to the church in Rome, is 2,000 years ago, and it was dark. But it's, I believe it's darker now. You know, we do see these these cycles of darkness come. But you and I are living in a day that Paul didn't live in. You and I are living in a time when we are without excuse more than they were. We have the complete revealed Word of God, and we have prophecy being fulfilled in modern history. Israel became a nation in 1948. In 1967, they got control of the holy city again. These are things that were prophesied thousands of years ago. We are without excuse. Paul said, never be lacking in zeal. You ever feel lacking in zeal? I'm guilty. I swear to you, I'm guilty. Don't be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. These people who are promoting all this sinful lifestyles and things, they have a fervor and a zeal for promoting darkness. Should we not have a fervor and a zeal for promoting the truth? That's why we can't be CIA Christians. That's why we've got to love one another. We've got to support one another. We're in a battle too many times. We try to bring the battle in here when the battle's out there. Oh, breaks my heart. Romans 13, 11. And Paul said this, and is speaking to us in our time because we have seen prophecy fulfilled. Do this, understanding the present time. Do we understand the time that we're living in? Mark Morrow did in his letter to the editor this morning, Christ is coming. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. Church, wake up. Why? Because your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. Well, that's obvious. If we know Christ is our personal Savior, the hour is nearer for us to face Him. Yes, our salvation, that's what Paul is talking about, is nearer now. Amen. I knew I wasn't going to get very far. And I didn't. Amen. These men were called out of the mundane. They were called to move and become. 
And we see that throughout the scriptures. You know, I think about those priests when, the, when God called Israel to take the promised land and the priests come with the ark. And so many of us are like the priests, you know. Uh, they they could have they came to the Jordan River and, and waited for the water to separate before they walked in. Oh, God, so many of us are waiting for God to move. So, so before we do anything for God, let's see him move in some miraculous way. When God is telling you, go do something now and I'll show you what to do next. You know, if the priest that day had waited for the water to open before they put their feet in, they'd still be there waiting today. So many people wait so long. You know, I'm reminded. We're going to ask those who are going to close us in a song to come forward and close us. I'm, it reminds me of this, and I, I, I'm just amazed at this. Those of you who heard the story, my mother, I was raised in a religion. My mother, for years, all of her life, the only time she took the name of Jesus was in vain, and she could take it. I was told she could swear like a sailor. She knew I was a minister, so she, she kind of, she kind of, you know, muffled it down a little bit when I was around, right? But for years, I talked to her about the Lord. I separated my children, my grandchildren from my family, separated from the Lord. I begged and pleaded and prayed with her, and on her deathbed. The night before she went to meet the Lord, she accepted Christ as her personal Savior, and she was baptized. I thank God for that. And I was blessed just a few weeks ago to see my sister. Now, you talk about individual, one-on-one, one -on -one, God speaking one-on-one. -on -one. We're at the Billy Graham Center. She's with her husband. The Lord spoke to her and saved her, and her husband refused. He had the same offer, same opportunity. Do you see what I'm saying, how special the Lord's call is? One is on their way to heaven. The other's still lost in sin. But think about this. Had my mother accepted Christ 20 or 30 years ago and changed, God could have taken that foul mouth away from her. He certainly would have taken the, the, using the Lord's name in vain away from her. She could have quit smoking those camels that she smoked every day. Might be alive today because of it. And how many more people in my family would have seen a change in her life and possibly come to know Christ as her Savior? Can't wait. When the Lord calls, we got to move. We got to start being willing to move and go when God calls us to. Or we're going to see the world continue to come crashing down around us. We're going to sing this song. It is glory just to walk, and it is glory just to walk with Him. I'm going to ask you to stand and sing it together. If God has spoken to you about anything, the altar is always open. You can come and pray all by yourself, or there'll be people to pray with you. It is glory just to walk with him whose God has ransomed me. It is rapture for my soul each day. It is joy divine to feel him near wherever my love may be. Bless the Lord, it's glory all the way. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory just to walk with him. Precious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this passage of Scripture that deals with the call. How we thank you that you are still in the business of calling. Lord, but you don't pull anyone. You just invite them to come and follow you, and they make the choice. Everybody in this room, Lord God, today probably made a choice one way or the other. Some are serving. Some won't serve. Some are saved. Some aren't saved. I simply pray, Lord, God is one beggar telling another beggar where I found bread that people would find you, be obedient to the call, and find out just how glorious it is, amen, to walk with you. Dismiss us now, I pray, in your grace and peace. Watch over and keep us. May that love of Jesus be so real in our lives that people see that light of Christ in us and are drawn to him because we have been faithful. We love you, Lord, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. It is glory just to walk with him whose blood has ransomed me. It is rapture for my soul.